Hey guys, this is Ryan Bishop coming to you with the third tutorial in my Java game programming series. Just to recap, in the last few episodes, I introduced the Abstract Windowing Toolkit, or AWT, and the Swing Library for creating windowed applications. Last time we made a simple hangman game using the JFrame object. And in this tutorial, I'm going to take things a step further. First, I'm going to introduce you to the Java 2D API. I'll explain the different things it can do, then we'll touch upon applets, and I've got a few code examples, one in which we make a simple applet version of the Asteroids game. Now, if you haven't seen my previous videos on the AWT and Swing libraries, I'll post a link in the description. I would highly recommend viewing those first. Also, I assume in this tutorial that you already understand the basics of object-oriented programming in Java. Otherwise, there are many tutorials out there on that subject. So without further ado, let's get started. So first off, what is the Java 2D? Now when I first started, I assumed Java 2D was a standalone API separate from the JDK. However, Java 2D is actually part of the Abstract Windowing Toolkit itself. Now the AWT contains geometry and image classes that allow you to create and manipulate vector and bitmap graphics which I'll discuss more in a bit. Now the heart of Java 2D is the Graphics 2D class which extends the Graphics class. Now this is similar to the Graphics device in XNA where the lower level device code is wrapped in a more user friendly class. The Graphics 2D class is the primary class we use for drawing and controlling shapes, images, and text as well as for creating and drawing to the back buffer. Now, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the Graphics 2D class can draw and manipulate both vector and raster graphics. So let's talk about vector graphics first. Now, anyone familiar with Flash knows that vector graphics are images drawn from mathematical algorithms. The biggest difference between vector and raster graphics is that vector graphics stay crisp and focused regardless of transformations. Also, while vector graphics are possible in XNA, they're much more accessible in Java. Now, raster graphics are far more common as they involve pixel-by-pixel -pixel drawing, which can lead to a loss in quality when transforming. In both cases, the Graphics 2D class has methods for drawing and transforming 2D graphics. So what's involved in creating vector graphics? Well, the AWT provides several geometric shapes that can use specified parameters to calculate position and size. And one such shape, just like in X and A, we use for collision detection, and that's, of course, the rectangle. Now, more important than the, def the defined shape classes is the polygon class, which allows the user to define a unique shape with arrays of coordinate pairs. That is to say, one array of X values that matches up to an array of Y values, both of which are passed into the polygon's constructor. Then, once you have your shape defined, the Graphics 2D class has a draw method for creating the outline of the shape, or a fill method to draw the solid shape. And we'll be looking at vector graphics more in the first code example. Now, the second type of graphic supported by Java 2D is the bitmap or raster graphics. And you can think of this as drawing or copying an image pixel by pixel and any transforms done on bitmap graphics affect the pixels rather than some mathematical algorithm which can lead to loss of quality in some cases. Now loading and drawing bitmap graphics is a bit different than drawing vector graphics however if you're familiar with loading content in XNA the process here is similar. First you create a toolkit object which is similar to the content manager in XNA and you use the getImage method specifying the name of the asset you want to load. You store this in an image object and can then use the graphics 2D draw image method to draw the image. And we'll be looking at this a bit more in our second code example. Now I mentioned earlier that the graphics 2D class also allows you to transform both vector and raster graphics. And the way this is done is similar to a matrix in XNA and it's done via the affine transform object. Like a matrix, we start with an identity, which in 2D is the origin 0, 0. We can then apply a translation, offset, rotation, or scale amount, and this builds a matrix for transforming our graphic. 
Now it's important to note that the Graphics 2D object has methods for transforming vector graphics built in, as we'll see in the first code example. However, to transform raster graphics, we must build an affine transform object and apply all transforms to that. Then we have to pass it into the draw image method to transform the image all at once, which we'll see in the second example. Now, on to creating the framework of our game. We'll be revisiting our old friend the JFrame for our raster graphics example, but I also mentioned we'd be using something new called an applet. Now, an applet is a web deployable version of our project. It's similar to the JFrame, but it runs on the web rather than in a windowed environment. And another difference is that it doesn't require itself to be instantiated, as its creation is handled via HTML. Now, this prevents the need for a main method altogether and our Asteroids game will be deployed via an applet. Now I'll be exploring our code examples in a moment, but first I want to take a moment to explain the core components that will make up the framework of any game in Java. First we have the display medium. Now as I explained, this can either be a JFrame for windowed applications or an applet for web-based deployment. You'll find several differences in programming an application versus an applet, but really it comes down to personal necessity or preference. Now one thing I've yet to discuss is the game thread. You can think of this as a sub-program that runs alongside our main program. In our first example, we use a thread for the purpose of our game loop, for updating and drawing our game components. Next is the key slash mouse listener. Again, I'm going to refer to design patterns where you have an object listening for an event, in this case keyboard input. And this is the basis for our input system, allowing us to tailor our feedback and output to the user. Of course, we have the repaint, which is called from our game loop thread, and that is used in our game to draw to our back buffer, then display the back buffer on the screen. Then we also have collision detection, which goes back to input, output, and feedback. And we also have sound, which falls just outside the scope of this project. But as always, if this topic interests you, I would encourage you to look into it. And finally, here's a basic diagram of the flow of our game. Now keep in mind, this is the flow for an applet, and I want to be clear, there are other ways of implementing a working framework in Java. Now, in our example, the pace of our game is set by the game loop thread, which runs continuously. And this constantly calls our game update and repaint. Now, repaint is a built-in function of the AWT's component class, which is handled differently based on the component type. For an applet, repaint calls the applet's update, which would really be better named as draw, because it's here that we draw each of our game components to the back buffer. Then we swap in the back buffer with our overridden paint method. So now that you have a good idea of what to expect, let's look at some code examples. So here's our first example, which is our Asteroids game. Now I think I'm only going to go through the main Asteroids class, because really, um, if you're familiar with um, classes, the rest of it just uh, defines the main functionality of uh, each component. Like, you've got the ship, which basically just defines a shape and uh, the behavior of the ship. Uh, same with the bullets and the Asteroids, and all those derive from a base vector shape as I um, explained what uh, vectors are, what vector graphics are. So basically you've got a shape and um, you can modify its position and velocity and its angles of movement. And that's basically what our bullet, our ship, and our asteroids derive from. So here we have the asteroids class, which is the main class. We've got our game loop thread, which we'll be talking about in a moment. We've got the back buffer, which we're going to use the graphics 2D object, which is this G2D. We're going to use that to create and to draw to our back buffer. Uh, show bounds never really got used, so you can disregard that. Um, we've got a uh, constant here, asteroids. We're going to be defining at most 20 asteroids. Um, we create our array of asteroids, which will be working with dynamically. Uh, same thing with the bullets. We uh, create 10 bullets to start. And we also create the player ship. And we also create um, an affine transform, which represents our identity matrix. 
and a random number generator. Now we start with the applet's initialize function. And here in the initialize function, what we're going to do is we're going to create our back buffer, which is just a buffered image. And then we're going to set our graphics 2D to the, the back buffer. So everything we draw is going to be to the back buffer. Then we can switch it out onto the, the main screen. So everything's going to be drawn to the back buffer and then replaced on the screen so that we have smooth graphics and it's not all um, jumpy. Uh, we're going to set the position of our ship, which is starting in the middle of the screen. Um, we're going to create our array of bullets and our array of asteroids. And for the asteroids, we're going to set a random rotation and position and a random move angle. And then we're going to add a key listener, and uh, more on that in a minute. So then we've got the methods for creating our threads. So we've got the start method, which is going to create the game loop thread, and we're going to start it here. And then we're going to run it, and this is the, the main game loop for our game. So um, while the current game loop is while the current loop the current thread is the game loop it's going to run through it's going to update our game uh it's going to sleep for 16 milliseconds that's basically a throttle so that we get a smooth 60 frames per second and then we're going to repaint now repaint this as i explained in the powerpoint it works differently depending on the component now for the applet what this is going to call is going to call the components update method. So let's jump to the the uh, update. Oh, one other quick thing I want to explain is the stop, and this will basically um, set the game loop thread to null, uh, so that it will be garbage collected when we're finished. So we're going to skip over the uh, the key listeners just for now. The update method, like I said in the PowerPoint. It should, it's better named as draw because this is handling all the drawing to our back buffer. So we're going to set the transform of our back buffer. We're going to set it to the identity so that everything we draw is based off the identity rather than some other arbitrary vector. Uh, we're going to set the paint. We're going to basically color the background, the whole background black. And this is similar to the graphics device dot clear in XNA. Then we're going to print some status information, which is basically a uh, draw string. Same, uh, same kind of method that you would see in XNA to draw a string. Then we're going to draw the ship, the bullets, and the asteroids all one at a time. And remember, we're drawing all this to the back buffer. And then we're going to paint this to the screen. So it's going to take the back buffer, it's going to paint it to our active screen, and then when we come back to the update, it's going to clear the back buffer again and redraw everything, and then again paint it to the screen. Now, the other part of the game loop thread is the game update. And if you consider this update as being like draw, then you can consider the game update to be the normal update. And what this is going to do basically, you're just going to get the screen dimensions because a lot of the updates use that. For example, the ship, if it goes off the screen, it will draw on the opposite side of the screen. So all the updates need the dimensions of the screen. So then it's just going to go into each of the components, going to go into the ship and the bullets and the asteroids, and it's going to update each of them. And then check for collisions. Check for collisions, I'm not going to really explain that. Uh, if you're familiar with game programming, um, you know that collision detection is a big part of, uh, of the feedback. And then you've got the draw methods, which are all called in the update. Uh, you're drawing the ships, bullets, and asteroids. Now, one other thing I want to talk about here is the key listener events. Now, like I said, this is one of the big components of any game. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to listen for a key to be pressed. And when that key is pressed, it's going to get the code for that key, and it's going to enter a switch case based on the key code. And then there are different key events that are fired based on the key code. Now I'm about to run out of time, so I'm going to cut this video a little short. In the next video, I'm going to show you the uh, running of this code, and I'm going to show you the game. And I'm also going to show you the second code example I have.